in the year 235 AD, life might have seemed pretty normal if you lived inside the Roman Empire. The empire had weathered its first battle with mass disease, plagues, and famine were relatively few and far between, and the ghosts of the Antonine Plague were all but a distant memory, even for the oldest people alive. The leadership over the years of men like Marcus Aurelius and emperors coming from the preceding Severan dynasty, for the most part, charted a steady course. From a big picture, zoomed out perspective, after the shock of the Antonine Plague, for about 50 years there was a period of recovery and reassurance. The military was recovering with long-wanted concessions, pay raises, increased enlistment. The professional ranks of the Roman bureaucracy and the imperial service widened, becoming more diverse than ever. Famine and plague during these years were relatively scarce. Public works projects, buildings, temples were built, rebuilt, and restored. Citizenship and enfranchisement was extended to maybe as many different types of Romans as ever. The economy seemed relatively strong. Famine seemed to be a thing of the past. Again, if at any point during the Roman Empire you could say things were normal, this would be one of those periods. But in just 15 short years, the Roman Empire would be struggling inside the greedy jaws of the greatest crisis it had ever faced up to that point. Instead of things being normal, the new normal would be permanent vulnerability. This period in history is known as the crisis of the third century. Historian Kyle Harper puts the dates at roughly 249 A.D. to about 284 A.D. Some historians differ on that. I've seen some that will put the dates a little bit earlier, say 235 or something like that. But the point is, this was a huge shock to the Roman system during this period. The frontier system seemed to be collapsing instead of permanent expansion, walls were erected. And as we all know, despite the intention of walls seemingly being a designation of strength, oftentimes more weakness is projected than strength from walls. The Roman economy during this period went through a crisis, currency debasement, inflation, eventually the entire Roman financial system had to go through massive changes just to survive. Changing leadership norms infected all levels of Roman government. Civil wars and battles for succession seemed to be common. Enemies and incursions on the different Roman frontiers seemed to constantly be at the gates biting off chunks of the Roman Empire, or creating problems that the Roman Empire during its peak would have been able to solve relatively easily. Religious tension bubbled under the surface as Christianity began its meteoric rise. All told, the crisis of the 3rd century was decisive. The incredible variety of shocks to the Roman system that were coming from an incredible variety of different places sometimes reads like a giant game of whack-a-mole from the perspective of the Roman government. Squash one problem and another one pops up somewhere else in the empire. Squash that problem and two more problems emerge as a result of it. Like trying to plug holes on a sinking ship with duct tape. Historian Kyle Harper believes that the crisis of the 3rd century was a decisive change in how the Roman Empire operated, but he also thinks that there's a significant cause 
that doesn't often get talked about. And of course, that cause is climate and disease. Rather than being background players that sometimes get mentioned after everything else, Harper thinks that these are essential parts of the story that need to be understood in order to understand what was happening inside the Roman Empire at this time. He says, quote, The concatenation of very specific and sudden blows to the Roman Empire in the 240s and 250s forced the system beyond the threshold of resilience. A withering drought and a pandemic disease event to rival the Antonine Plague lashed the empire with a force that was an order of magnitude greater than the combined menace of Gothic and Persian intrusions. The collapse of frontiers, dynasties, and fiscal order was as much the consequence as the cause of the crisis. The edifice of empire buckled along the seams of structural fragility, but the blows from without provided the fresh destructive force. End quote. The interaction of climate and disease with human decision-making and institutional decision-making would change the Roman Empire forever, and it would never be the same. During the crisis of the third century, a Christian bishop in Roman Africa wrote that, quote, The world has grown old and does not stand in the vigor whereby it once stood, nor do the strength and liveliness that once availed it still abide. In winter, there is not such an abundance of rains to nourish the seeds. The summer sun burns less bright over the fields of grain. The temperance of spring is no longer for rejoicing and the ripening fruit does not hang from autumn trees. End quote. Scholars have often looked at the metaphor of this passage, perhaps as some sort of religious metaphor for the time, but historian Kyle Harper looks at this and he thinks, what if we took it a little bit more literally? What if he was actually describing some metaphors that actually related to the environmental situation that was going on at the time. Maybe the metaphor is that of the world being this aging person who is becoming older and cooler and drier as they get older, as opposed to the warmth and the vigor of youth. Earlier in this series, we talked about the climate period in the Mediterranean during the peak of the Roman Empire. It was known as the Roman Climate Optimum, and it was generally a period of stable, wet, and warm weather. There were variations from place to place, and certainly acute events could pop up weather-wise from place to place, but overall this was stable, wet, and warm. But climate scientists have shown that the Roman Climate Optimum began to give way to something called the Late Roman Transition Period. And this different period of climate goes from about 150 A.D. to 450 A.D. And of course, correlation never equals causation, but this is the period where things in Rome began to fall apart. And it's also a period of climate upheaval and change and distress. In general, this late Roman transition period meant less insulation coming in from the sun, so less direct solar radiation. This led to more chill weather, increased dryness, ice creep began to be common as glaciers began to creep down mountainsides. And this changing climate regime had an impact on some important pieces of the Roman Empire. Perhaps most importantly, Kyle Harper points out the Nile River. The Nile River is typically one of the most dependable flooding systems on the globe. Egypt and the areas surrounding the Nile River were the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, feeding literally tens of millions of mouths. 
about 90% of the Nile River waters come from runoff that comes from the highlands in East Africa. There are these big rainy seasons there that dump huge amounts of water and then it makes its way downstream towards the Mediterranean. Throughout this process, there's human-based irrigation pumps and things of this nature, and there's also predictable flooding, typically. But from about the year 156 onward, historian Kyle Harper traces a much higher number of erratic flooding periods, or weak flooding systems, or disastrous flooding incidents. Typically, a strong El Nino weather system correlates with weaker Nile floods, and there were way more El Nino events from about 150 to 400, almost one every three years. This combined with the dryness and chill of the late Roman transition period perhaps created some major issues on the Nile River. From 246 to 248, there were grain shortages due to drought and this bizarre flooding situation. Anytime you have grain shortages, that could mean direct starvation for people in Rome, but it also has secondary and downstream effects. Less grain is going to mean less tax revenue for the Roman government. It's going to mean less trade, perhaps the collapse of businesses and economic systems that rely on grain. Credit and banking are going to be influenced. In general, the idea is this is something that's going to put strain on the Roman system, not to mention some of the other crisis of the third century issues that we mentioned earlier in the episode. Historian Kyle Harper thinks that this grain shortage coming out of the Nile River area and spreading, the effects of it spreading across the Roman Empire had an underrated effect on the crisis of the third century. But it wasn't just famine and drought coming from the Nile area. Once again, during this period, it was plague and disease coming from this area and spreading across the Roman Empire. The plague of Cyprian, which raged from about 249 to 262 AD, is named after that bishop who we mentioned earlier, Cyprian, who recorded some information on the plague. And while it had a similar trajectory to the Antonine Plague as far as spreading from the southeast to the northwest of the Roman Empire, it wasn't smallpox. Historians think it was probably some sort of influenza pandemic or possibly a phylovirus like Ebola. At any rate, this was a empire-wide disastrous catastrophe. Here's none other than Cyprian describing the symptoms of this plague. He says, quote, As the strength of the body is dissolved, the bowels dissipate in a flow that a fire that begins in the inmost depths burns up into wounds in the throat, that the intestines are shaken with continuous vomiting, that the eyes are set on fire from the force of the blood, that the infection of the deadly putrefaction cuts off the feet or other extremities of some, and that as weakness prevails through the failures and losses of the bodies, the gait is crippling, or the hearing is blocked, or the vision is blinded. End quote. Historian Kyle Harper offers a more modern view of the symptoms that someone infected with the plague of Cyprian might have had. He says, quote, The pathology included fatigue, bloody stool, fever, esophageal lesions, vomiting, conjunctival hemorrhaging, and severe infection in the extremities. Debilitation, loss of hearing, and blindness followed in the aftermath. End quote. This disease was not smallpox. There was no signature full-body rash. Again, it was probably some sort of phylovirus like Ebola. Some people think it might have been an influenza pandemic, but 
Kyle Harper leans towards something like Ebola, the symptoms match, and that would explain why people were scared of caregiving during this time. It didn't seem to be spread by aerial droplets, but rather by bodily fluids. Again, Romans didn't have sophisticated understanding of how contagiousness works, but we do see some understanding, as there was this fear of caregiving. There were these plague pits where bodies were burned after being infected and buried in order to avoid contact with everybody else. Evidence of mass graves during this time period, it goes way up. The bottom line is, this pandemic raged for at least 15 years. It hit cities and towns, urban and rural alike. It said that there was a 62% decline in the population of the city of Alexandria alone from the beginning of this thing to the end of it. You can extrapolate that to any of the other major cities in the Roman Empire and the population, broadly speaking, and you truly have a terrifying pandemic on your hands. You throw this plague into the ever-evolving crisis of the 3rd century that's unfolding right during this time period, and you have a recipe for chaos. Here's how Kyle Harper describes it, quote, The structural integrity of the imperial machine burst apart. The frontier system crumpled. The collapse of legitimacy invited one usurper after another to try for the throne. The empire fragmented, and only the dramatic success of later emperors in putting the pieces back together prevented this moment from being the final act of Roman imperial history. A thoroughgoing fiscal crisis made it impossible to collect taxes and maintain the currency with any credibility. This failure violated what the Romans recognized as the fundamental axiom of empire. An empire requires soldiers, and soldiers require money. As the currency regime dissolved, the infrastructure of the private Roman economy started to crumble. The fire fed on itself. An accelerating spiral of disorder engulfed the empire. End quote. I like the way that's phrased because it does a good job of showing how each of these separate elements are all playing off of each other to continue to spiral the crisis worse and worse and worse as things go further and further down. Drought, pandemic, the collapse of the frontier system, failure of taxation, the crumbling of the Roman economy, currency debasement, price instability, inflation. I mean, at one point, the professional army of the Roman Empire, the thing that was maybe the signature of the Roman Empire, the professional army, was in total disarray. Ordinary Romans were encouraged to take up arms for themselves. That's old-school Roman Republic style. As this is all happening and the technology and institutional training gap between the quote-unquote barbarians and the Romans is getting smaller and smaller, many of these peoples or groups or armies, whatever you want to call them, were smelling blood, and the frontier system continued to fall apart. What's really remarkable about the crisis of the third century is not only that it happened, but maybe more surprisingly that the Roman Empire got through it and recovered. But even though the empire did recover, it would be fundamentally changed in a lot of different ways. The response to the crisis of the third century fixed some problems in the short term, but in the long term opened a door that could potentially lead to disaster, which it ended up doing. A couple of key changes that happened as a result of this crisis of the third century was a change in the way imperial politics worked. The first change was the rise of military emperors. A Roman emperor by the name of Galenaeus instituted a policy that basically removed the Senate from controlling armies. He was trying to remove the influence of the senatorial class from the military. And of course, Roman history has a long tradition of senators and senatorial elites controlling armies. 
It seems like a good idea in theory because it might put a stop to some of this infighting and civil wars and struggles for power inside the empire. But in the long run, it does open the door for the rise of these professional soldier kings. This new class of empire still observes the Roman traditions for the most part, but one change they make as the silver currency is falling apart during the crisis is they begin paying their soldiers in gold. Historian Kyle Harper says, quote, In the course of time, the soldiers' regular stipends, denominated in silver currency, became worthless, and the donatives functioned as a salary. Great victories continued to deserve bonuses, too. We gain a sense of the possibilities from a treasure discovered at Arras in northern France in 1922. A clay pot belonging to a military officer held precious jewels, silver objects, and 472 coins, including 25 gold medallions, earned during a military career that seems to have stretched from 285 to 310 A.D. One of the gold medallions weighed 53 grams, celebrating the reconquest of Britain by Constantius I, father of Constantine, who is acclaimed as the restorer of eternal light. Diligence and loyalty were handsomely repaid. The politics of gold would redefine state and society from inside out. The age of the barracks emperors was to be the age of gold. End quote. This was a massive change in not just the Roman military, but the Roman financial system, and it would represent a sea change in the way business was conducted for hundreds, thousands of years, more than a thousand years onward. More massive changes were coming to the Roman system. The emperor Diocletian, who ruled from 284 to 305, put an end at least to the squabbles over the throne and the civil wars and that type of thing, but also divided the empire. Territories were chopped into slices to allow imperial governors more control. The size and the scope of the army on the frontiers was expanded, in part due to this gold system. He standardized the tax system throughout the empire. He tried and failed to deal with inflation and economic issues. But in general, Diocletian gets credit for helping to stabilize things after the crisis of the 3rd century. Constantine is the next notable ruler, ruling from about 306 to 337 AD. This is the longest rule of any emperor since Augustus, and it can't be understated the importance of just having these two leaders, Diocletian and Constantine, over a 50-year period to provide stability as opposed to the constant power struggles and the constant civil wars. Stability in leadership is good for empire. Constantine is an interesting figure in and of himself, probably most known for moving the capital to Constantinople, as well as his conversion to Christianity, which is obviously huge for the Roman Empire and huge for world history. In some ways, he reminds me a little bit of Professor Slughorn from Harry Potter, where he seemed to really be impressed by prestige and ceremony and tradition. So he ended up bucking the trend of merit and turning back to a system that rewarded the senatorial elite. He set up a sort of patronage system similar to the old Roman way where he was the top patron and he surrounded himself with people that were loyal to him and he bestowed upon them honors and victories and many triumphs, if you will. He expanded the senatorial class almost to an absurd degree, but it ended up being an effective way to govern. He also instituted conservative social policies and generally gets credit for stabilizing the Roman system. In the 300s, throughout the Roman Empire, you generally see a resurgence of global trade, a revival of business and commerce and banking and economics in general throughout the Mediterranean area is happening all across the Roman Empire. 
a big key to this was Constantine's shift to a gold economy as opposed to a silver economy. Historian Kyle Harper calls this the capitalism of the sea. Gold was in, credit and banking were at all-time highs in the Roman Empire, the different regions of the empire were trading, engaging in commerce that had never been seen before to these levels. Items like oils, textiles, horses, slaves, grain, cheese, iron, wines, wheats, barleys, foodstuffs, animals. This was a complex and huge economic machine. Kyle Harper points out that during this Roman economic resurgence during the 300s, the overall climate was generally better in the 300s for this period of recovery than it was during the 200s when the crisis of the 3rd century was unfolding. As for why this is the case, he identifies pressure gradients in two key zones over Europe that together form what's known as the NAO. Generally put, the way these were unfolding led to more rainfall over northern and central Europe and to a lesser extent the rest of the Mediterranean even though Mediterranean weather is notoriously hit or miss. There was also more incoming solar radiation during this period in Roman history than any other. Again, we're seeing that warm, wet weather that seems to correlate well with economic success for the Roman Empire. That being said, when analyzing Roman tombstones, we do see that there were examples of droughts and famines and even localized epidemics. And despite not being as widespread as something like the Plague of Cyprian, these could still be devastating. Importantly, they also highlight the extent to which environmental conditions contribute to disease conditions. Basically, what this means is that climate events can become disease events very quickly. A food shortage or a weather event or a famine or a migrant crisis these events can play off of each other and quickly become disease events. Kyle Harper points out an example of this snowballing effect in the way that climate and disease can interact. He says, quote, Our most acute report of local breakdown is the narrative of a famine and pestilence that swept Edessa and its hinterland. In March of A.D. 500, a plague of locusts destroyed the crops in the field. By April, the price of grain skyrocketed to about eight times the normal price. An alarmed populace quickly sowed a crop of millet, an insurance crop. It too faltered. People began to sell their possessions, but the bottom fell out of the market. Starving migrants poured into the city. Pestilence, very probably smallpox, followed. Imperial relief came too late. Kyle Harper's quoting someone now talking about it, saying that the poor, quote, wandered through the streets, colonnades, and squares, begging for a scrap of bread. But no one had any spare bread in the house. Back to Kyle Harper now. In desperation, the poor started to boil and eat the remnants of flesh from dead carcasses. They turned to vetches and droppings from vines. Here he's quoting someone else again. Quote, they slept in the colonnades and streets, howling night and day from the pangs of hunger. Back to Harper. When the December frosts arrived, the sleep of death laid low those exposed to the elements. The heaps of corpses were all the church could handle. The migrants were worse affected, but by spring no one was spared. Harper then quotes a historian who says that, quote, Many of the rich died who had not suffered from hunger. End quote. Okay, so that's a pretty long quote there, but it illustrates a couple of important things. I think it shows that sometimes we have a tendency to separate different categories of historical learning. For example, let's look at the political history of something, or let's look at the economic history of something, or let's look at the religious impact of something. But the reality is all of these things are connected. In this case, a weather event led to a famine which led to a demographic migrant crisis, which led to crowding, 
which led to a religious response, which probably ended up spreading the disease more, which ended up leading to a massive disease event, not alleviated by the state. So you're seeing the extent to which these seemingly separate events are all interconnected. And I also like that quote at the end where it says something along the lines of the wealthy people who were eating just fine before the crisis ended up dying just like the poor people out in the streets. Throughout these climate and disease events, the wealthy and powerful would learn the hard way. Nobody was spared. Climate and disease don't care about wealth or power or prestige. And you may not care about some famine that's happening somewhere else or some migrant crisis that affects a neighboring country or some disease that's hitting another area of the world. It's easy to dismiss climate and disease and the effects of it as correlation equals causation. But just like that town that we quoted, All it takes is one snowballing effect of climate and disease, and you might be singing a different tune. Again, climate and germs don't care. It reminds me of that great scene in The Dark Knight Rises where the rich guy tells Bane that he should do what he wants him to do because he paid him to do it. And Bane, of course, delivers the great, this gives you power over me? Do you feel in charge? So next time you watch that movie, just imagine Bane being the downstream effects of climate and disease on society. Anyway, back to the Roman economy in the 300s. There was plenty of increased social mobility and economic opportunity to go around, but in general, there was still a class system to be had in the Roman Empire. At the top of the pyramid were the senatorial elites, the top 1% class, who controlled an enormous amount of wealth during this period in the Roman Empire. Kyle Harper says, quote, The scale of economic stratification was truly staggering. The top senatorial families of late antiquity owned stupendous wealth. According to the breathless reports of a Greek observer, Each of the great senatorial houses in Rome was like a city in its own right, with fora, temples, fountains, baths, and even hippodromes inside. Houses of the top rank had incomes of 384,000 solidi, while those of the next rank earned 72,000 solidi per year. These incomes are the equivalent of something like the production of 80,000 family farms per year. End quote. Below this top class of wealthy people, you had smaller landowners, merchants, businessmen, craftsmen. Below them, you had peasants, landless farmers, the plebs of Rome on the grain dole. Most historians think that these lower classes actually lived okay for peasants. The Roman state did have an interest in taking care of its tax base. And below this group, you had the truly poor and the destitute. Gregory of Nyssa, a Christian at this time, writes about this underclass of Roman towns and cities. He says, quote, Their roof is the sky. For shelter, they use porticos, alleys, and the deserted corners of the town. They hide in the cracks of walls like owls. Their clothing consists of wretched rags, their harvest depends on human pity. End quote. A reminder here that even as the quote unquote capitalism of the sea is unfolding around the Roman Empire, even as economic systems are being revitalized and cities are growing and credit is expanding, not even the great Roman Empire was immune to growing wealth inequality. That being said, there is some debate about how much of this was becoming more common in this period versus how much of this was simply just being recorded more. Some historians think that as Christianity began to rise in the 200s and 300s, writers with a Christian mindset of looking after the poor just documented this type of stuff more, so it seems like it was happening more at the time. 
And this, of course, brings us to another key response to the crisis of the third century. And that, of course, is the rise of Christianity. Kyle Harper looks at evidence from tombstones and gravestones. He also looks at evidence from documents as far as who has a Christian name and who doesn't have a Christian name. And by 300 AD, about 15 to 20 percent of Egypt had a Christian name. What that shows is that by 300 AD, Christianity was spreading in numbers that had never been seen before for a new religion in the Roman Empire. Kyle Harper argues basically that Christianity's rise is correlated directly with the existential threat of the plague of Cyprian. We talked in the last episode about the Antonine Plague and how people turned to the god Apollo to help them deal with the fear and hopefully provide them with comfort and wisdom in a time of mass chaos. Kyle Harper argues that this time around, during the plague of Cyprian, there was a general dissatisfaction with traditional pagan religion's response to the plague of Cyprian. What's important to understand is that the pagan religious tradition was wrapped up in the civic, bureaucratic, political tradition of the Roman Empire. So as the political dysfunction and the civic disengagement continued as a result of the crisis of the 3rd century, the religious pagan elements of that system were also falling apart in some degree. Temple building is almost non-existent in this period, which in and of itself doesn't say anything, but combined with the rise of these Christian names and the increasing number of Christian documents we find from this period, and it seems like there's a religious shift that's going on in the empire. Again, paganism and traditional religion in Rome was a cog in a system that was massively stressed and, in hindsight, collapsing. This left the door for something new to walk through. And Christianity seized the moment with promises of reassurance and hope and afterlife, which surely hit home at a time of mass dysfunction and plague and famine. Historian Kyle Harper tells a story that shows how the religious polytheistic pagan Roman traditions were wrapped up in the political and civic life of the city. So when the political and civic life began to experience crazy shocks to the system, that was bound to trickle down into the faith in the religious system, basically. He says, quote, a wealthy Ephesian citizen and Roman knight named C. Vibius Salutaris established an endowment in honor of the goddess Artemis. The interest from the endowment, maintained by the temple, funded magnificent religious pageants, celebrating the long history of the Ephesians. Effusive gifts of cash were given to the citizens along archaic tribal lines. Blood sacrifices were made to the goddess. These religious endowments were utterly wiped out in the financial chaos. The old patterns of civic patronage were destabilized. The ancient gods did not lose out in a crisis of faith. They were embedded within an order whose foundation itself cracked. End quote. That doesn't mean that paganism just suddenly disappeared from the world in the year 300, but what it does mean is that Christianity was becoming a force in not just Roman social life, but Roman politics. Again, the door was left ajar by this crisis, and Christianity seized the moment and stepped right through. So, whether it's this changing religious atmosphere with Christianity stepping into that door, or whether it was other doors that were left ajar, whether it was military emperors, drastic shifts to the entire economic system. I mean, imagine in your country the currency just going away and being replaced by something else, basically at the drop of a hat, and then the system being strong enough not just to recover, but to surpass the heights that the previous Roman economy reached. 
that's incredible resilience. But anyway, Rome was reassembling itself after the crisis of the 3rd century, and it's a testament to the resilience of the Roman Empire that it did. But the rifts and the cracks and the social upheavals and stresses of this imperial system that was sick, to say the least, puts all of the pieces together to set up the end game of the fall of the Roman Empire, in the West at least. Historian Kyle Harper talking about the Roman Empire at the end of this crisis and at the end of the recovery to this crisis says, quote, The healed patient was not quite the same in the aftermath. The empire that reemerged was based on a new equilibrium with new tensions and new harmonies of state and society. It required more than a generation of trial and learning to calibrate, but what emerged from the rubble of the crisis has been rightly described as a new empire. Whereas the Antonine Crisis had sapped the empire's batteries of stored energy but left the foundations intact, the crisis of the 3rd century was transformational. It should be called the first fall of the Roman Empire. And even in this dimly lit corner of the Roman past, we can see that the environment was a protagonist in turning imperial fortunes. End quote. So we've shown how climate and the environment and disease played a big role in this crisis of the third century that transformed the Roman Empire, a recovered and resilient empire at that. But Rome's resilience was coming to an end soon. Environmental and systematic shocks were coming that would destroy the Roman Empire in the West and basically destroy most of what we think of as Roman in the East. The end was coming. 